Okay, folks, welcome back to PBS Books' ongoing coverage of AWP 2018. I'm sitting right now with Nathan Hill, who's the author of uh, a much celebrated book, <laughs> The Knicks, uh, which is now in paperback. Really cool to have you here, welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, what a cool thing first, just to start off with the fact that a guy like John Irving says about your book, uh, that it's a Dickensian, and that he, I think he said, and I wrote it somewhere, an <laughs> ambitious novel without ever feeling pretentious. Um, pretty cool to have a guy like that and others that have really gotten on board with this book. That was really nice of him. It was, I, I had to uh, kind of breathe a little bit when I first heard that. He was one of my early literary heroes. You know, I, I started reading him uh, when I was, a, I was an undergrad at the University of Iowa, where, of course, he lived for a long time. So there's J John Irving stories everywhere. And, and, uh, and so I read all of his work, and, uh, and for him to be a fan was pretty incredible. Yeah. yeah. One of the things you hear about that whenever people talk about the Knicks is this amazing story. People get embroiled in it immediately. They get sucked into this, this thing. It's epic, though. It's many, many pages. And your own story is really interesting. I mean, this is a, this is a book that you came to later. You had been working on other things and, and were frustrated um, and found your way to this book. Yeah. Well, there's this thing that happened. So I, you know, like a lot of writers, I went through uh, like an MFA program and I, I, I moved to New York City after I finished my MFA. And the thing about like declaring to the world that you're going to be a writer is that eventually you have to like do it, you yeah. know? <laughs> uh, and so like, you know, you tell your friends you're going to be a writer, you tell your family you're going to be a writer, and then you get done and you're like, well, there, you put all this pressure on yourself to be a writer. And so I found that I was doing all of this work and I was like thinking like, what editors can I send this to? What publishing houses might want this? And unsurprisingly, the work was really bad and it was rejected everywhere. Uh, and so, yeah, I sort of dropped out of publishing. I, I moved away from New York City. I stopped sending out to agents or editors and just decided to work on something that was really strange, idiosyncratic, and ended up being, like you said, sort of long and, uh, and just hoped that it would find its, its readership. And I'm just really lucky that it has. How did you not, we'll, we'll dive into the Knicks in a sec, but how yeah. did you not lose confidence during that period when, and, and also to have the confidence to step away and know that you needed to step away, that you were somehow too deep in this like vision that you originally had. Well, I lost confidence thousands of times along that way. Like, you, you, but the thing is, um, I, I, I realized somewhere along the way that, that if there was no guarantee that anybody was ever going to write the book or read the book, uh, then it might as well be fun to write it. I might as well enjoy the process, you know? Um, and so even if it was never published, at least it would have some inherent value to me. Um, and so that's where, honestly, where it was, when the book started getting a lot of humor and a lot of energy was I was just trying to have fun while I was doing it. And it became sort of like my hobby, like the same way people garden you know like people don't garden because they want to be famous or yeah. they don't think their their garden is a failure if a lot of other people don't see their garden it's just that they like to garden and and the book writing the book was sort of like that for me it was just like i don't know if anybody's ever going to want this but i like doing it and, and so that's that's where i guess the confidence came from it's just like well it doesn't matter i'm enjoying myself yeah and you found your way you, yeah. you got into the story and started building it and the story is about sam or samuel mm -hmm. and he has an interesting name andresen <laughs> anderson uh-huh um, who is in some ways similar to you. He was like you know, frustrated, things weren't working, um, looking for a, an avenue into the writing world, not finding it. Yeah. That character might have sprung from you. I, I mean, tell me about when you decided to put that character together. Did you say, this is me? Or did you say, no, nope, this is not me? I mean, how did you think about it? He came a little later. He was not the central character uh, of the book when I first conceived it, but he you know, after I moved away from New York and kind of made this change, he showed up and uh, I decided to wrap the book around him and really channel a lot of the anxieties that I had been feeling about not being successful, about not getting published, uh, about working on a novel for years and years and years and, and feeling like I had nothing to show for my efforts. You know, um, when you work on a novel for 10 years, eventually your friends stop believing that you're really writing yeah, it. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, right, Nate's working on his novel, you know. Um, and, and so a lot of that kind of embarrassment I just gave to him. Um, and so he's, yeah, he's pretty sour. He's pretty um, uh, kind of pissed off at the world. Um, he's an adjunct uh, uh, comp teacher, which is something I did myself. Um, he's quite sour about it. I actually, I really like teaching, yeah. but, but Samuel doesn't. Um, it's just more dramatic that way. Um, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of my own and the frustrations in that part of my career I, I gave, to, gave to him. Yeah, he's also a gamer. He takes out a lot of those yep. frustrations on this game that he plays, the world of Elfscape, which right. is very world of work. Warcraft sounding. Oh, it's uh, completely you know. a ripoff yeah. of World of Warcraft. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so <laughs> he, he, he buries himself in this game to sort of take away some of the frustrations of his current life. You did the same. 
I did, yeah. During a sort of dark time uh, when I was living in New York City, uh, all of my all of my things were stolen one day. Um, like you know, books, clothes, my computer, on which everything I'd written on gra in grad school had been saved. And so suddenly, I, like I had no writing and I had no books. You know, you know it was a very dark time for me. Um, and I was I was living in New York City, working for a poetry organization. So you can imagine like what my salary was. Like making rent was a constant adventure. So I was like, it was it was not. I wasn't having the, the greatest time. But I started playing this video game at that time. And I remember like I would come home at the end of a frustrating day and then fire up this game and play with people and I was good at it and they were good at it and we valued each other and we were a weird kind of community. It is a community. And, yeah, yeah, and we sort of lifted each other up in this strange way um, uh, in a way that I didn't really even realize was happening until years later when I started reflecting on it. And so, so yeah, I, I had this strange love-hate relationship with this video game where eventually I really hated like how much time it was taking away from real life. Like it's a game that requires a lot of like it's practically a part-time job to be good at it you know um, uh, so I really resented that and though I was sort of embarrassed to like cancel social plans because I had to go raid with my guild you yeah. know um, <laughs> but at the same time I appreciated that what it did to help me through a, a dark time in my own life so that kind of love-hate relationship I put into the book and it gave something to the book as well yeah yeah and then in the next enter Faye you know Sam's mom who is a 60s era, era radical uh, who finds herself in the middle of this viral video, right? Yeah. That she's like throwing these stones at this uh, candidate, this, this politician, and is now going to be in trial. And, th and then enter the sort of struggled relationship. Faye had abandoned her son long ago, and that yeah. rage uh, that Sam feels about it, that confusion that he feels about it, takes up a huge chunk of the book. That idea yeah. of the mother and the son dichotomy. Can you explain that and how you? found yourself in there? Because I've, I've read that you told your mom, mom, that is not you. <laughs> I, the I, Warcraft thing is yeah. me, but this is yeah, not you. Yeah, I have to like, uh, I'm almost contractually obligated to my mother to, yeah. to tell everybody yeah. that's not, yeah. you know, she yeah. never abandoned us nor anything as far as I'm aware. Um, no, that was, that's much more um, in keeping with the larger themes of the book. Like uh, what the book is, is really about, I think, uh, uh, is, uh, is people who are estranged from each other. Um, and that, of course, uh, is, is true with Samuel and Faye, the mother and son, where she, she leaves, leaves the family unexpectedly one day when he's 11 years old and he doesn't see her again for 20 years. But it's also true of the, one of the gamers um, in the book is estranged from the real world. He's done such a deep dive into this video game that he finds it very difficult to have interactions outside of the game. Um, there's a college student in the, in the, in the novel who's, who's sort of obsessed with her image on social media and it's, it's difficult for her to, to move outside of that. And of course it's about political protest too, which is kind of the ultimate in, uh, estrangement. You know, people who uh, have lost the ability to communicate and, and it ends up being, you know, riots in the streets. And so all of these, the these things seemed, although very, very different in subject matter, seemed thematically kind of, I don't know, there was some ma magnetic pull uh, uh, between all of them. So I put them all in the same book. But, uh, but Faye, um, that, re that relationship really came from, you know, my mother never abandoned the family, but we did move around a lot when I was a kid. Um, from, from my dad's job. We, we moved every two years. So I was born in Iowa and we moved around Iowa a few times and then to uh, Chicago and St. Louis and uh, a stop like at a cattle ranch in Oklahoma for like a couple of years and then Wichita, Kansas. And that was all before high school. So if you've ever been like the new kid in school, yeah. you know how like lonely that can feel and yeah. how isolating that is. And so that loneliness and that isolation, that's what I gave to Samuel. Yeah, and then the idea of, of dropping this you know, politically active um, mother uh, in the middle of, of a time, maybe the most politically active period since the 60s. Uh, yeah. One of the, you know, this amazing weird time that we're in right now, it just seems so that this, the book, this book just sort of explodes like a bomb on top of a time that's highly political. Well, it, it seemed like the, the more I looked into the, the riots and the protests at the, at the uh, Democratic Convention in 1968 in Chicago, the more I felt like there was a kind of rhyme with the current political situation. Like, uh, I felt like, um, I don't know, like in, in 68, each side reduced the other side to the most unendearing stereotypes you can imagine. And it felt like we were kind of entering that, that period again. I saw this study recently. That it's this study that's done uh, uh, of incoming f college freshmen. It's been done every year for, for decades. And, uh, and they just found that, uh, that fewer incoming college freshmen now um, consider themselves politically moderate that at any time since 1969. 
Uh, and uh, and it just felt like we're entering this period of like hyper polarization, hyper -po you know, a, a hyper political moment. Um, and 68 felt relevant again, you know. And so so yeah, so I, I decided to kind of put those two epics together in the novel to see see what would happen. Yeah, the the, the difference it seems to me right now is that uh, in like 68 there was a, a more decidedly uh, singular focus on one side or the other. You had the Black Panthers, and you had you know some other people, the Weathermen, and some of the people were more radical. But now you've got so many subcategories, you know, this, you know, that are seem to be exploding. And it seems to me though that the book will resonate is resonated specifically for that reason. There's just people, there's an anger out there that you're just kind of happening right on top of at the moment. Well, it's funny. I, I wrote a, a there was a political there's a political candidate uh, for president in the novel. Um, uh, and when the book came out, the book came out right before the election. And uh, this guy's like, you know, hyper right wing, you know, very um, uh, uh, super conservative candidate for president. And everybody was like, you modeled this after Donald Trump, obviously. And the, the, the truth is, I, I wrote that character like eight years ago. Yeah. But there is a certain trajectory that you could see was 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 coming, you know. So um, in some ways, uh, in some ways, the book was was uh, it was lucky that it, it came out when it did. It, it happened to speak to the moment, even if kind of accidentally. Yeah. You, I want to revisit if you. The, the, the notion of that there were people that had sort of given up on whether, you know, Nate was ever going to write that novel uh -huh. and you would go to these parties and tell people, no, I'm still working on it. <laughs> uh, the satisfaction of having it come out and be well received and now being able to come to an event like this and for someone to hold the paperback version, which is lovely and beautiful, and to be able to say, yeah, that's me. And it, and it, it all worked out. It just took a long time to realize it. Yeah. What it, is that feeling like knowing that it's like the satisfaction of being Ten years and longer in the making for this book. That's a really good question. Uh, uh, nobody's asked me that before, so I don't have like the the, the answer on the tip of my tongue. I, I do know that that um, it's it wasn't it wasn't necessary, you know, for the book to be published or or or, or to be successful for me to be happy with it. Like I I remember telling a friend of mine that uh, the book was either, you know, p people were either going to like it or is going to leave like a me-shaped hole in the floor, you know. And either of those those would have been fine. Um, but I've 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 uh, now been touring for the book for about a year and a half and met so many amazing readers, um, so many great, uh, you know, bookstore owners and librarians and people who run book clubs. And, and it's been after 10 years of sitting alone in a room, you know, doing this thing where the only other person who knew what I was doing was my wife to now have such a big community around the book and have met have, to have met so many people, not only at this conference, but also on my on my tour around, and, and around the world is just I, I, it's, I could have never dreamed of anything uh, so, so fantastic. So it's been, it's been great. It's there been was really never great. like a yeah. see I told you so moment for you? Like oh, for sure there was. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I definitely had that moment. Oh, my, my parents, when, when, I, when I went to college as an undergrad, I was like, I want to be a writer. And my parents were just like, that's really dumb. <laughs> and they're like, you should write in your spare time and study something that will make you money. And so like, you know, I, I, I studied uh, engineering. I was an engineering major for two years before I finally went ahead and switch to, uh, to, to writing. Um, and uh, they were very, very worried about that. And so when the book finally did come out, it was nice to be able to tell my parents, who are incidentally wonderful and big fans of the book, but it was really nice to be able to say, told you so, I knew what I was doing all along. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think maybe your engineering background might have helped with a book of this size. I mean, there's like, <laughs> to, to craft something like this, to put it together, to stay on this track without spinning off, you know, is challenging, a book of this magnitude. This is a sweeping epic here. Thanks. So, like, you do you sort of need that engineering mindset. Yeah, perhaps. there's a kind of like very mathy architecture going yeah. on underneath the book. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. It, it maybe. felt like as you're reading some of it that it does feel like it's in, written in pieces and chunks and almost like mini novellas, you know, to some degree. Well, I I realized um, somewhere along the way, like, there's you write this this book and it, it is it's got a lot of a lot of moving parts, you know, and you I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't outline beforehand. I really like writing in a in an improvisational uh, kind of way. Um, I, 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 uh, I, when I sit down, I don't know what's going to happen that day, but I know, I know what I want it to feel, you know? And so that's, that's the way I, I proceed. And that's just what makes it exciting for me. Um, there's this E.L. Doctorow quote that I love. Um, he said, writing a novel can sometimes feel like um, driving across the country at night. 
but you can only see as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. And it, that's what it kind of felt like. Um, but ultimately, I realized that the, the novel should be structured as just a simple mystery. You know, in any good mystery novel, um, the reader gets the information at the same time that the de detective does. And in this case, it's, it's Samuel, and he's trying to figure out the mystery of his mother, why she disappeared and what she, what she was doing. Um, uh, in the in the kind of cloud of her youth that he he, he never knew about, uh, and so uh, um, I, I decided that given that it's a book with a lot of moving parts, if it had a very simple structure, just a, a structure of like a mystery, then uh, then hopefully the reader will be able to kind of scale the, the wall along with me. Yeah. So now you've you know you you had the freedom to sort of really work on all the moving parts to really put it together and to think about it, um, and you, you said that it. it you didn't know how it was all going to turn out, and you were going to be proud of it regardless. But mm -hmm. now you're thinking all about the next phase of your writing career, yeah. right? And now this thing that's been this hulking part of your life for a long period of time is, is to some degree in the rearview mirror. You're looking forward now. So what do you, how do you start to think about that next phase, or have you always been thinking about it's, the next I, novel? Well, yeah, I've, I've had a story sort of marinating in my head that I started... Um, in the, I had a at a moment between turning in the manuscript for the Knicks and the book actually coming out. I had a good four or five months there, uh, and uh, and so I started the next story. And uh, and as the book tour happened, and I, I I didn't I kind of put that aside, but it's been marinating in my head, and I have you know a good you know probably twenty thirty pages of notes and maybe fifty sixty seventy pages of prose. On and the then next your novel, head, your head's working it too. Yeah, constantly. right. Yeah, so hopefully when I when I now that I have some free time, um, uh, I uh, I'm I'm making some good progress on the next one. But there's a there is a nice kind of freedom to it though. Like uh, there's like uh, there's 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 a there's a nice uh, lack of anxiety about whether anybody's ever going to want this book. Like I have a I have a great publisher who's looking forward to the next one. So that's that's a privilege, you know, yeah. to be able it to. It sounds like this was the time when it was supposed to happen for you. That that if it would have happened earlier. I'm not sure you would have had all these perspectives the way. Maybe that you I don't know. I have a, I have, I have like more than a decade of failure uh, <laughs> under my under my feet, uh, which is it maybe help, helps to keep one a little humble. Yeah. yeah. Well, th this is an amazing book, and you've been on so many best of the year lists, and the Knicks continues. Now the paperback life continues. You're mm -hmm. going to see like book clubs and others grab on this <laughs> thing and roll. Um, but Nathan Hill, the Knicks, really cool to have you here. Thanks for making time for PBS Books today. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Really a pleasure. Good luck with everything to come. Thank you.